Welcome back everybody to another reaction video. So we have completed our look at Alexander the Great by Epic History TV. And today we're going to be taking a look at the Battle of Agincourt by uh, History Marsh. Now we're familiar with History Marsh, we've done a few of their videos before. Never taken a look at this particular one though, so this should be interesting. Um, it's been suggested by a couple of people in the comments, but this is also something that I'm really interested in. The Battle of Agincourt is perhaps my favourite medieval battle. Um, no surprise at all, considering that I'm English. Um, but I tend to view it through um, a lens of what, you know, the sort of contemporary lens rather than the sort of rose-tinted, almost quasi-mytho, you know, mythological lens that we tend to have of the battle now in England. Um, you know, like the idea of the, the longbow being like a medieval machine gun and things like that, um, that fired armor piercing rounds, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of myths around Agincourt that have sort of risen up, which should be interesting to get into uh, if the video itself doesn't cover them. Um, we've picked up a few, quite a few new subs actually in recent weeks. So if you're new to the channel, a very, very warm welcome to you. I hope you enjoy uh, what we all do here. So uh, there's reaction videos every Wednesday and a Friday. So please make sure you're subscribed and notifications are turned on. Uh, please leave a like and drop some comments uh, as well. I do read all the comments. I try to reply to as many as I can if I have something to offer. So please make sure that you get some conversations going. Um, also, if you want to support the channel a bit more, there's also a link to my Patreon in the description. Please check that out too. The more people I get supporting me on there, the more videos I can make. So, um, so yeah, so we'll just uh, dive straight in, I think. So, um, I may split this into two parts, I think, because like I say, there's a lot that I have to say about this. Um, so we'll just see where it goes. So this is uh, History Marsh, the Battle of Agincourt. On a warm August morning, clear sky above the coast of Normandy announced the start of a pleasant summer's day. Some 5,000 inhabitants of the port town of Harfleur, located close to the mouth of the River Seine, started their daily routines. By noon, French fishermen dotted the open sea, casting their nets just off the coast, when a horrifying sight appeared on the horizon. A vast array of ships heading south across the Channel. The anticipated English invasion had finally come. Just a small note, but I already like the way that they're presenting this because I've already, I've always said, you know, when you're teaching a topic like history and science, um, things that rely on a lot of the time very dry stuff like statistics and, you know, dates and cold facts and things like that. Um, to engage people in history, it always helps to ground it in an emotional way. So I, l I already like this, you know, little details that you wouldn't necessarily think to include. You know, like the French fishermen going out at dawn, casting their nets over the side, hoping for a good catch, you know, of uh, fishing for the day. And they see this huge fleet on the horizon. You know, it's a really good kind of um, expressive way, you know, of getting yourself to picture it because it, you know, it, it evokes much more than just saying, on this day, the English fleet landed at Harfleur, you know. So I, I always like when uh, history and science and things like that are grounded in that way. The great victories at Crecy and Poitiers had brought vast expanses of French territory under the English crown. This apparently endless war that began in 1337 was fought over English claims to the French throne and various English possessions within France. But in the years since, most of these lands were lost through a lack of determined initiative and the distraction of dynastic squabbles at home as well as the dark legacy of the Black Death that disrupted the social fabric of most of Europe. By the early 15th century, only a patchwork of French territories were still under English control. And now, in 1413... Yeah, so just a quick point uh, before he gets into um, what he's going to say next. Um, it's called the Hundred Years' War, but um, that's more of just a historical descriptor than, you know, something that's 
actually particularly accurate. Um, it's just a way of grouping all of these disparate conflicts together because they were all fought over the same thing, which was the English claims to the throne of France. You know, it was much more like something like the Wars of the Roses. You know, the Wars of the Roses lasts, you know, a couple of decades plus. But it wasn't constant fighting. You know, you would have a battle, then two or three years of peace. Then you would have, you know, three or four battles. Then another couple of years of peace. Then you would maybe have 10 or 12 battles and then 12 years of peace. You know, it wasn't constant fighting. So the Hundred Years' War, when you dive into it, it's actually broken into phases. You know, and there might be years, decades even, that separates any kind of, like, major combat. So, um, you know, just, just a, a little thing just to keep in mind. The 26-year-old Prince Henry V became the new King of England. Imagine that. Imagine, you know, if anyone's older than that um, that's watching, imagine, you know, just think what you were doing at 26. You know, I'm nearly 30, and I, even now, I can't imagine for the life of me ever leading anything on the scale of a country. You know, so just, it's just incredible, you know, that these people were often so young. Having inherited the throne from his father, who overthrew the prior King Richard II, Henry's position as ruler was far from secure in the early years of his reign. Yeah, so this, um, so people might recognize Lancastrian from, you know, the Wars of the Roses. So this is already setting the stage for the Wars of the Roses. And um, so uh, King Richard II, who um, Henry's father inherited the, fr the throne from, well, he didn't inherit it, he took it by force, so... Um, but Richard II was um, a very ineffectual ruler. He's often sometimes regarded as a tyrant. Seems to be a thing with Richards, you know. Um, but, you know, he deals with things like the Peasants' Revolt, but he's also, you know, he was the king who lost a lot of English territory in France, so he's already unpopular there as well. Um, he's very feeble on the issue of succession, so there's often a lot of confusion and insecurity about, you know, will the realm stay together after his death, you know, and things like that. Um, so King Richard II was the son of Edward the Black Prince, who was the eldest son of King Edward III, who initiated the Hundred Years' War. And at the time in England, the how we think of um, hereditary titles, as in like passing to the eldest son, that wasn't actually firmly established yet, and it wouldn't be for quite a while. Um, English kings at the time, they tended to sort of, it was very fluid. You know, sometimes it would pass to the eldest son, sometimes it wouldn't. You know, Anglo-Saxon kings, for example, they didn't have really any concept of um, primogeniture, I think is called, where it passes to the eldest son. Um, Often it would pass to something like the eldest brother and things like that. Um, so the, the concept of primogeniture wasn't firmly rooted in England yet. So when, but Edward III had actually introduced a law um, close to his death that said inheritance would pass to the eldest son, but then his eldest son died before King Edward III did. So people were now thinking, well, should it then pass to Richard or should it pass to... King Edward's second son, and eventually the group that was supporting Richard won out, he, become, he becomes king. Um, so Henry IV was um, also known as Henry Bolingbroke. He was the son of John of Gaunt, who was Edward's, King Edward III's son. John of Gaunt was the first Duke of Lancaster. So Edward III makes these dukedoms for his uh, sons, and it's the first time that we have dukedoms in England. And um, what this does, though, inadvertently, is while under Edward's rule it strengthens the crown because Edward is a strong ruler, but under a weak ruler it will dramatically weaken the crown's authority because you've now got very, very powerful landowners. You know, making his sons dukes makes them the most powerful landowners in the country which means that they all have royal ties, meaning they've all got claims to the throne, and they also have enough power and money to vie for it if they want to. So while under Edward's rule it stabilised the crown, under successive rulers it actually ended up destabilising the country. Um, so like I say, Henry IV, also known as Henry Bolingbroke, is the son of John of Gaunt, um, so he's Edward III's uh, grandson. And um, he was actually exiled 
by Richard II, but he comes back, usurps him in a coup, takes the throne as his own. Um, but now, obviously, people are thinking, well, um, you know, if he's taken the throne by force, then what's to stop other people doing the same? You know, because obviously the Lancaster's most powerful opponent at this time is the House of York, and which was the uh, descendants of Edmund of Langley, which was one of uh, Edward III's other sons. Um, so you've you've got this sort of power struggle already emerging, and uh, Henry V takes the throne, and he's facing plots left and right to try and usurp him, because, like I say, it starts to destabilize the country. You've got all these powerful landowners with all with ties to the throne in some way. Um, but now they all, for the first time, they have more than enough power to challenge the crown. So we're starting to see those seeds being laid um, that would trigger the Wars of the Roses. Wars of the Roses starts in 1455, so, you know, it's 40 years away, um, but, you know, that just shows how deep-rooted this problem was. Um, had Henry V lived, who knows, it might have been different, because Henry V was a very strong ruler for his, for his time, um, but he dies very young. He, he dies in 1422, I think, so not that much later, you know, only seven years later, after, after Agincourt. So he doesn't rule for that long. As sections of the nobility viewed him as the son of a usurper, conspiracies soon arose against him. Although uncovered and ruthlessly suppressed, the political discord and tension between the nobility and the royal house was laid bare. Nevertheless, Henry saw an opportunity to both further reassert his authority at home and realize his ambitious plans abroad by looking across the channel. Yeah, so that's uh, an age-old tactic, uh, which is when you have a problem, the Romans used this, you know, they had this art, they, they had this down to an art, which was if you have problems at home, then, you know, look overseas, you know, get some glory, get a glorious conquest under your belt. You know, Emperor Claudius of ancient Rome, perfect example. Claudius comes to the throne after Caligula is murdered, and um, he's elevated to the throne basically by the Praetorian Guard. Um, they just find him cowering behind some curtains and think, oh, this guy will do, let's put him on the throne. Um, obviously he was related to the to the royal family, but um, the imperial family, should I say. Um, but he's installed on the throne and people are viewing him as kind of a weak, ineffectual ruler. So he thinks, you know what, I'm going to send the legions and go conquer Britannia, something even Julius Caesar couldn't do. And that conquest actually shores up his rule because the conquest is successful. Um, but that's just kind of like what I'm getting at, which is it's an age old tactic. You know, if you have issues at home, create a distraction, you know, go on some overseas venture. France faced its own political crisis. King Charles VI's insanity weakened the kingdom, leaving the affairs of the state unattended. Sorry to keep interrupting, but that is actually not a joke. You know, he actually did legitimately think that he was made of glass, and if, if people touched him, that he would shatter. And um, just skipping ahead a little bit, actually, um, Henry VI, the son of Henry V, who basically leads... England to disaster. You know, he loses most of the territory in France and, well, in fact, he loses all the territory in France. And, you know, he, um, his just weak rule basically results in the aristocracy tearing itself apart. And that's what triggered, really sets off the Wars of the Roses. Um, he was the son of Henry V, obviously, but also Catherine of Valois, uh, who was Charles VI, uh, Charles VII, sorry. Is that the seventh? No, it's the sixth. <laughs> Sometimes I struggle with Roman numerals. Charles the sixth's uh, daughter, um, part of the compact that ends uh, Henry V's phase of the war was that he would marry Catherine of Valois, which was very common at the time to do that. Um, so it's thought that Henry the sixth actually inherited um, that genetic disorder, whatever it was, that causes what they describe at the time as madness um, from his grandfather, from Charles the sixth. So that's probably where that comes from. Resulting in a power struggle among the nobility. This was the perfect moment for Henry to press his claims. 
He not only demanded Aquitaine and the lands ceded to the English at the Treaty of Bretigny, but also laid claim to former Angevin holdings of Brittany, Normandy, Maine, Anjou, and Touraine, as well as Flanders, which has never been in English hands. In addition, the French were to pay the outstanding 1.6 million crowns from the ransom of John II, captured at the Battle of Poitiers in 1356, and Henry would get Princess Catherine's hand in marriage, King Charles's young daughter, along with a dowry of two million crowns. For some perspective, the price of a war horse would have been around 80 crowns, so the total amount of 3.6 million that Henry asked for could buy 45,000 war horses, an amount close to $550 million in today's money. In return, the English king would renounce his claim to the French throne, inherited from his great-grandfather Edward III, who was a maternal grandson of the former French king, Philippe IV. Now, obviously, we'd look at that and think, well, there's obviously no way that France would have agreed to that, so of course, which is kind of like the point, you know, in a lot of medieval diplomacy was really just to say that you'd tried <laughs> to stop you looking like a, you know, an aggressive tyrant. Um, but also when you, you know, in the context of the time, um, giving up territory and money in exchange for basically saying you can keep your crown um, was actually kind of, it was actually a pretty common deal, you know, so this wasn't that uncommon, but obviously the amount of territory um, that was demanded, and obviously look at the territory, you know, if we just scroll back slightly, if we look at the territory that they're asking for, so they already hold Calais, but they're basically asking for the entire French coastline apart from just this little bit down here which means they control all the ports, which means they control all the trade. So um, there's absolutely no way that France would have agreed to that because if England ever wanted to in the future, it could basically starve the French of trade. It would have reduced France to basically a third-rate power at this point. Colonel grandson of the former French king, Philippe IV. Unsurprisingly, the government of King Charles, dysfunctional as it was, would not concede to such astronomical demands, instead offering a dowry of 600,000 crowns <laughs> and an enlarged... Henry, are you insane? <laughs> That's a good joke. ...enlarged Aquitaine. The English saw this counteroffer as an insult, claiming that the French had mocked their claims and ridiculed the king himself. Henry seemingly believed that his claims were just, and in his mind, if he could not get justice, he would take by force what rightfully belonged to him. True to form, his preparations for war started long before negotiations with Charles broke down in June 1415. Yeah, like I say, a lot of negotiations in the medieval period was basically just to say that you tried. The wily English king used the protracted talks to secure the support, or at least the neutrality, of John the Fearless, Duke of Burgundy, which would deprive the French coast of maritime protection. And on August 11th, with fair wind, the English fleet set sail for France. The first objective was Harfleur. The fortified port had long been a thorn in England's side, serving as a base for frequent raids along the south coast. Capturing it would thereby reduce the threat against English ports and would serve as a vital base of operations into France, along with Calais, situated further up the coast. Yeah, because look, it controls the mouth of the Seine. And what's on the Seine? The French capital, Paris. So if you control the mouth of the river, you essentially control the entire river at that point. You know, you can exercise influence right the way up it. You know, think of something like the American Civil War. The first, pretty much the first objective of the Union in the war was to capture New Orleans. Why? Because it controls the Mississippi. You know, it's the mouth of the Mississippi. If you can control the Mississippi, you know, obviously, control, full control of the Mississippi came much later after the fall of Vicksburg. but. If you can control the mouth of the river, you can launch operations up the river and secure control over the entire thing. So, you know, good strategic thinking. On the afternoon of August 14th, 
King Henry's army landed near the mouth of the River Seine. Upon landing in Normandy, the decision was made to surround the town and cut off possible reinforcements and supplies. Okay, so just a couple of things before we get into it. Um, so we see here, so we've got men at arms, which were basically um, knights of various, you know, class and things like that. Um, you know, they they didn't they weren't forced to be you know particularly wealthy by any means, but they were just you know um, wealthy enough that they could afford their own weapons and armor essentially. Um, but the real power of English armies at the time came from its longbowmen. Um, there's a lot of kind of quasi myths about longbows, particularly at this time in history, which is you know stuff like they could penetrate plate armor and things like that. They couldn't. Um, but they were very effective at taking down lightly armoured targets, such as horses. Um, and that's where the real destruction of French cavalry comes from. Um, but also look at that, they have cannons, you know, and even Edward III's army in 1346 at Crecy, he had cannons in his army. They were very, very, very rudimentary cannons. They were more like, uh, they were called uh, ribolts or ribaldikin, I think is how you pronounce it. It, which is basically they look like organs, you know, like a like a pipe organ in a church, and they would fire like stones, arrows, all sorts of stuff, um, kind of like an early form of grape shot in a way. Um, but by 1415, cannon had become more sophisticated. You know, you had what were called basically like bombards, which were large static pieces um, that were used to attack walls. You know, field artillery wouldn't really come till much later. You know, for a lot of, you know, for quite a while actually, for a couple of centuries, cannons were very large, very cumbersome, very heavy, so more effective in sieges than on the field. Henry's brother, Thomas, Duke of Clarence, was sent to block off the eastern approach, while the king remained to deploy the main body of the army. Siege weapons and 12 guns had to be brought closer to the walls to be effective against half laws strong defences. The town, with its 5,000 inhabitants, was protected by four and a half meter thick walls, water defenses, and 24 towers, with a well defended port and a garrison of 250 men. So, on first glance, that doesn't sound a lot. Just 250 men against 11,500. Obviously, it doesn't sound like, like much. Um, but that's where fortifications come in because the more elaborate and, you know, well-designed fortifications are, you can have a few dozen hold out against several hundred, maybe even thousand, quite easily, um, just purely because of how the fortifications themselves are constructed. You know, it takes, you know, because you might have a lot of men, but you don't have a lot of frontage, which means you can only, you know, deploy so many men at one, at any given time. Say if you have you know, 20 ladders. That only means 20 men at a time can be going over the walls, for example. So 250 men will always be outnumbering the people on the walls. So uh, coming up the ladders onto the walls. So, you know, force, uh, force multipliers like fortifications and things really can't be underestimated to their effectiveness. You know, there's a, um, an example of there was a royalist garrison during the English Civil War in the 1640s um, where I think something like 40 people, and this included like women, children, I think, uh, but also like cooks and scribes and things like that, so not even all soldiers. Um, and I think the garrison was actually led by um, a, a woman as well. It was, a, I think she was an aristocrat, you know, one of the um, noble women. And she actually coordinated the defense, I believe. I can't remember the name of the castle. If someone knows, please drop it in the comments. Um, but it was besieged by something like 900 parliamentarians, and they held out repeatedly um, against repeated parliamentarian assaults. So you really can't underestimate the effectiveness of uh, good fortifications. In his message, Henry demanded surrender attempting to instill fear in the minds of the populace by citing a biblical law that gave him the right to put the townsfolk to the sword if they refused to yield due to his right to the French throne. 
Meanwhile, as Thomas advanced to surround the town on the landward side, a relief force appeared. 300 French men-at-arms rode with haste towards the gates, under the command of Raoul de Gaucourt. Although a small retinue, the presence of these professional soldiers would stiffen the resolve of the populace. Determined to resist the invading army, the French closed the sluice gates to inundate the valley to the north. Harfleur would not yield to Henry's demands for surrender. Soon after, the English siege train unleashed hell on the town. Over the course of a few days, the bombardment inflicted significant damage to the walls and towers, with some projectiles reaching buildings in the middle of the town. The threat of death from above became a daily occurrence for the inhabitants. And also, just to point out as well, is that walls didn't fall nearly as quickly as they do in games or in movies and things like that. Um, these walls are thick, and they're just solid stone all the way through. Um, and cannons, while they were, you know, a real game changer in siege warfare, because for the first time you had something that could reliably blow through these walls, um, you know, because of the kinetic energy and things like that behind them, um, it's, you know, the walls still took a lot of punishment before they actually fell, unless they were poorly designed. You know, something like a, a palisade or a wooden wall would fall, you know, within hours, but um, something like a thick stone wall like this, that could take days or weeks of constant bombardment before you got through. But the townsfolk and soldiers responded, manning the guns on the walls and bulwarks. They harassed and inflicted heavy losses on Henry's irreplaceable teams of gunners and siege engine crews, who had to get close to the walls to be effective, thereby placing themselves in a vulnerable position well within reach of the French. At night, the resilient defenders made frantic repairs to their damaged defences, much to the also, one of the reasons why it often took so long to get through the walls, because unless you kept up the bombardment constantly, then it was going to be very difficult um, to actually break through the wall because uh, the defenders could just repair the wall. Um, an example of a good strategy to use um, against this was to bombard them at night, which is what the Mexicans did at the Alamo. Uh, in 1836. Um, they would bombard at night, which would have the added effect of depriving the garrison of sleep, and it would also mean that if they were to make repairs in broad daylight, they were much more vulnerable to sniper fire and things like that. The astonishment and frustration of the English besiegers. And by early September, some 15 days into the siege, the summer heat turned the water in the flooded valley to the north into a stagnant and foul, disease-infested swamp. As the siege dragged on with little progress, dysentery began ravaging the English army. The dire situation forced Henry to adopt urgent measures. He ordered mines to be dug under the walls, intending to collapse the tunnels to undermine the town's defences. However, his mining crews were frustrated by counter-tunnels dug by the French. The stubborn townsfolk would tunnel their way to intercept and damage the English works and attack their crews, sabotaging all attempts to undermine the town's walls. Above ground, the English king ordered the wooden towers to be brought up against the wall to launch an assault on the town. But by this time, the siege went on for a month. Although not lengthy by medieval standards, it required more time and resources than Henry anticipated. Unsanitary conditions, polluted water supplies and, as suggested by a contemporary chronicler, bad effects of unripe fruit, grapes and shellfish sapped the English army, and having thousands of men, horses and other animals in close proximity, along with the waste they produced, created conditions that were ripe for infections. The yeah, which was also not uncommon for the age either. Um, 
especially in sieges, because, you know, you've got a lot of dead bodies from, you know, combat and disease and things like that, which just creates this vicious cycle where you get disease piling on top of disease. Um, so, yeah, not that uncommon for, you know, disease, dysentery, um, things like that to plague a camp, um, either the besiegers or the besieged for that matter. The outbreak of dysentery caused the death of many, while many more fell ill. Earls, knights, esquires and archers alike were incapacitated, with many granted permission to return by ship to England to recover once the siege was over. However, reports of dysentery and half-law indicated that the siege began taking its toll on the town as well. But, despite privations, bombardment and disease, the defenders rallied, launching a sortie on the English siege works. Led by Gokur, the French men-at-arms set fire to Henry's siege bastion before retreating to the safety of the defences. The English now faced the prospect of a prolonged stay under the walls of Harfleur. For Henry, it was now or never. The king launched a desperate assault on the bulwarks outside the main gate, supported by a constant rain of arrows. English bowmen managed to set fire to one of the towers using flammable arrows, which gave the dismounted men-at-arms the upper hand. Fierce fighting ensued as the French attempted to drive the English back. But the invaders took control of the gate fortifications, forcing the defenders to retreat into the town. On the following day, the king demanded surrender for the second time. Again, he was rejected. Frustrated, Henry sounded the trumpets for the troops to prepare a full assault, ordering the remaining guns to maintain a steady bombardment and not allow the defenders any sleep. Mm. Frightened of the... Pro yeah, kind of like what I was getting at earlier, which is one of the ways that you uh, wear down the will of defenders is to keep the bombardment going so they can't rest. They, not, they can't rest and they also can't make any repairs. Um, which leaves them, you know, highly vulnerable when the attack actually comes. Prospect of the town being taken by storm, with the biblical law permitting the slaughter of the inhabitants if they refuse to surrender, sections of the population wavered. Although he was determined to take the town by storm, Henry was relieved when the defenders agreed to open negotiations. Talks continued for two days, until, on September the 18th, Town officials agreed to yield half law if no relief force came by September 23rd. Raoul de Gaucourt sent messages out, but received word that the French army had not yet gathered enough troops to give battle. No help would come. With no other choice, the Lord of Gaucourt surrendered the town on September 22nd. Again, which isn't that uncommon for medieval sieges either, so taking a town or a castle even by storm was actually extremely difficult for the reasons that I've already said. You know, fortif good fortifications are very effective force multipliers, so even a tiny garrison can hold out against a very large one, a very large attacking force. Um, so it was actually more common to try and force the surrender of defending settlements rather than to try and take them by storm. Because if you could do that, you can save many lives on your own side. You know, um, a full assault on a, a well-defended settlement or castle or something like that could end up with crippling casualties for your own army. So um, trying to basically scare them into submission was um, the thing. It was what you did um, for that reason. Um, perhaps the greatest pioneers of that in the medieval era was probably the Mongols, who um, would show absolutely no mercy to any settlement that resisted them. To settlements that submitted, they actually treated them pretty well. You know, they basically let them do their own thing so long as they paid tribute to the Mongols. You know, apart from that, they didn't really care. You know, they had kind of remarkable tolerance, really, for the time. Um, but for settlements that resisted, they would literally destroy everything. They would raise the settlement to the ground and they would kill everyone in it. So when you get stories like that spreading, um, it frightens, you know, that's one way they frightened people into submission.
after Half Floor had capitulated, leading members of the defending garrison were set free on the condition that they gave themselves up as prisoners at Calais. English officials were placed in charge of the town, allowing the French inhabitants to remain if they swore an oath of fealty to Henry, while the rest were expelled. The invaders, meanwhile, incurred heavy losses. A third of the English army was either dead or incapacitated. Henry now had roughly 7,100 troops left at his disposal. After resting the men for a few weeks, the king garrisoned the town with 300 men-at-arms and 900 archers before marching out into the rolling countryside of Normandy with 900 men-at-arms and 5,000 archers. Okay, so I think that's kind of the end of part one. Um, it looks like we're on to sort of part two, which is the actual Battle of Agincourt now. Um, so I think we'll leave it there for now. Like I say, we'll split this into two parts because, you know, I do have quite a lot to say on this topic. So um, it'll be nice to have two parts to this video. Um, but again, if I haven't paused it at the right point, if this, you know, if there's actually a little bit of this part left, I do apologise, I did that a few times in the Halloween specials that we just had, so um, sorry about that if that's the case, but we'll continue with this uh, next time, so make sure that your subscribed and notifications are on so you don't miss that. In the meantime, thank you all so much for watching, and I shall see you all on the next one.